Dear uh, brothers and sisters, dear friends, I'm welcoming you this morning and we all welcome you this morning to uh, divine service and to the house of the Lord, the house that we are praising our creator and sustainer. I'm uh, glad to be with you this morning and also I'm uh, very anxious to uh, deliver this message. It's a, a very simple message, but um, as you all uh, probably heard before, or you, or you all know, the best message to receive is the simple message that goes to the core of the truth, right? The, the, what we need to hear is the truth. That's what we need to hear. The truth that comes from above. And uh, today, uh, today, the message, as I said, it's very simple, very um, something that we heard before. And as the brother already uh, read the opening text, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, how many times did you hear that? How many times did you probably hear the, the message uh, being uh, spoken from, uh, from pulpit? How many times did you hear the, let me tell you one thing. When I was a kid, I heard this story of Esther, I probably was three years old, from my great grandmother. I don't know about you, but uh, I never forget. I mean, this is such a, a warm, such a um, captivating story that gives us a glimpse of what can God do to us. And today, I would like to spoke, uh, speak a little bit more. What can we do to, what can we do from our part to allow him to work through us? So. Now let us go to the, uh, some history that uh, it comes with this story, right? Or something that uh, when uh, my kids were, well, Susan is still in the, in the school, uh, but when they were in the, in the lower grades or in the middle school, in the, in the elementary, sometimes they come uh, from school and they say, you know what, today the teacher was asking about the history or this or that, and nobody knew, but I knew it. And everybody's looking at me, how do you know that? from the Bible. I was, you know, teach that. I mean, I was I learned that in the, in, the, in, you know, in the church. And they look at how, wow, where in the Bible? How did you learn this? You see, if you go to the Bible, it can teach you many, many things. Everything that you need, you can be teached, or the Bible can teach us uh, everything. So history. Let's go to history. So now, who can tell me what was the real name of Esther? Now you look at me, what are you talking about? What was the real name of Esther? Hadassah. That's right in the beginning. Her name wasn't Esther. Uh, in Hebrew, Hadassah, it means mid, uh, middle. So in, uh, Esther, in Persian, in their language, it means a star. So that's one thing. So historical settings. When was this happening, the Esther and then and, and all this story, when was this happening? It was in? Persia, right? In the city of Shushan or Susan or Susa or there's many different, uh, you know, a variation of this Shushan. That is a, in Hebrew, Shushan. That is right. So it happened in the city of Shushan, who was the capital city of which empire? Persia. Persia, right? That's right. And so let's go back. Before Persia was which empire? Babylon. So, death of Darius the first, which they call a great, Darius the Great, was in 486 BC, right? And his son was by the name or by their uh, that name, Xerxes, or in the Bible, called here in, in this book of Esther, it calls Ahasuerus, uh, which is uh, in Hebrew, Ash oh, no, Ashwerosh. So this is the, the king that Ahasuerus or Xerxes, which was a son of the Darius the Great the First. So after his assassination of the, the, this king Ahasuerus, uh, which was 465, his son um, successed him uh, after his assassination. So, so his great, uh, ruler ruling of this king Ahasuerus was from 480, uh, 400, 486 BC to 465 BC. So what that gives us 
21 year, right? 20, well, almost 20 years, right, of, of the rules. Okay, so this is, uh, and in the Bible, uh, Esther is after which book? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. And before Nehemiah is Ezra, right? So this happening, or this story was happening in between um, Ezra and Nehemiah, somewhere in, in, in between these two uh, um, books, or in this uh, time. So, with Ezra, 50,000 of Jews when already been sent by the um, uh, Kir, already uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in their homeland in Jerusalem. And after that, there was a lot of Jews still in, in, uh, in the country there. And they live, you know, not only them, but their children. So they were already, what? They were already, you know, kind of well, assimilated, or they were live, you know, the, a lot of people didn't even know they're Jews. But if you read in, in, the, in the book of Ezra, sorry, in the book of Esther, uh, if you read, you can find that uh, uh, um, Amman, when he was uh, talking to the king, he said, there are people who are different who don't care about your rules, who don't care about your, uh, your uh, gods, who lives their own life the way they want. See, they knew they were different. The Jews were different people. Different people how? They live the different way of life. So anyway, so uh, the, uh, in the time of Dar uh, Darius and his son Xerxes, Persian Empire was at the highest, highest powers or highest um, uh, level and uh, at that time, the Esther was become a queen. So as we said, Shushan was one of the capitals. The other two capitals was uh, Ekbatana, and the other one was Persepolis. So a little time uh, line of events. You all know the, the, the book of Esther, right? You all know what was happening, that the king, right in the beginning of chapter one, he had a great uh, feast for his kingsmen or his people, you know, around him, and how long this feast was lasting? No, oh, that, that was so so strange. How long was the feast? 180 days. Imagine that. 180 days. You drink and eat. You drink and eat. And whew, I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to do this. But anyway, 180 days. After that, he made a feast for the everybody, for all the people, whoever want to come, for another seven days. So after that, so that event was in April 483, so three years into his uh, ruling, three years into his ruling, so 483 BC. The Esther was summoned, so with the rest of the uh, virgin uh, from the kingdom, in January 479. So the Esther made queen, now guess this, it was summoning of Esther was in January, in the same year, in December, so almost a year, it was a preparation. Almost a year was a preparation. So she was become, she become a queen in December of 479. 479. And then again, after that, Haman uh, cast lots, or he started to, you know, his uh, uh, his work against the, the Jews in April 474. So five years. Esther was a queen, five years. She was a queen, and then uh, Ammon, or Haman was uh, cast a lot, and was talking to the, queen, uh, the king, and asking for the, uh, for the, 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 the what do you call the uh, ring, so he can do, king giving the ring, so he can do whatever he wants with the Jews. And the Haman decrees was the same year in April. So Mordecai decree, which reversed, actually it wasn't impossible to reverse, so they made a new decree, to, uh, to, for the Jews to defend them in June, same year, 474. So it was two months after the, the first decree. And then the celebration of Purim was in March 473. So these are just uh, some uh, dates, some uh, historical um, uh, data. Now, I have another question for you. Why do you think that Haman hate Mordecai? Why do you think? He hated him. What did it say in the Bible? He hated Mordecai. Why? Well, he, he didn't want to bow to him, right? But that wasn't the only reason. That wasn't the only reason. 
He wanted to destroy all the Jews. Remember that. He wanted to destroy all of them. Why was that? It's written in there in the chapter 3. Why was that? So if you read there in Esther chapter 3 verse 1, oh, we can read this if you will. Sorry, I left my Bible here. You can read that. So Esther chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 1, and after these things that King Ahasuerus promote Haman to son of Amadei, Agaga, listen to this, uh, promote Haman, the son of Hamedata, the Agagite. What is Agagite? And advised him and set the, his seat above all the princes that were uh, with him. So he make him, what, a prime minister, somebody above everybody else, just below the king. But he was an Agagite. So what do you think, who, who's this? What do you think? Who was Agag? Who was Agag? Who can remember? Going back to 1 Samuel 15, that was the king of who? Which uh, uh, people? Which people? Agag was the king of Amalek. Amal Am sorry, Amalekites. Amalekites. And who were Amalekites? Who can tell me that? Enemies of the uh, Jews, but why they were enemies of the Jews? Because in the wilderness over there, they were, well, start to kill the, all those people behind who were older, who were, you know, uh, unable to follow, you know. They, they were really cowardly, you know, treating the, the people. But who were Amalekites? Amalekites, sorry. Amalekites. Who were, who were these people? Do you ever read this? Sorry? Descended of Esau. Of Esau, there was a descendant, the uh, grandson of Esau formed this tribe or this uh, um, people, and from them, you know, they're descendant of Esau or Esau. So, in uh, First Samuel uh, chapter fifteen, uh, prophet is telling to uh, to the king of. Um, um, Saul, yes. To the king of Saul is telling, destroy them. Why? Because they were, you know, doing so, so many, so many bad things to you, their animal. They should be destroyed. So what uh, uh, Saul did, he bring it back, he destroyed whatever he wants, he bring it back the king. He said, I did what you told me, what the Lord asked me to do. And the prophet Samuel said, what I hear, this is not what the Lord asked you to do. You didn't destroy everything. You didn't follow the rule of follow the uh, Lord's command. So uh, Samuel took the, the sword and killed uh, Agag, the, the, the king, right in front of them. So this Haman was descendant of Agag, or this king. He was descendant, and he hated each and every Jew that he could find over there. He really hate them, really hate them. So he wanted to destroy it. And he find a way how he's going to do it. And as I said, they set the date in April 474. They set the date, we'll destroy all the Jews so we get rid of them. And one really interesting detail, he said to the king, I will pay personally 10,000 talents of silver. You know how much money is this? When he says that, I mean, 10,000, yes, so 10,000 talents of silver, it's a lot of, you know, when you think. Basically, today, it's a little less than $200 million. Where you get all this money? You know, that's a lot of money to pay to the king so he can follow whatever he wanted to, to do. $200 million to destroy Israelites. One interesting detail. You all know what happened in, in Esther, that you know, this is something that uh, really, really known to many people, to all of us, basically. But you know that in the book of Esther, God's name didn't mention once. There's no mention of God's name. There's no mentioning of God's name. But we knew, right? We knew that it was God who, how we, did we knew this? Well, there was Jews there, and there was, you know, who's their God? Well. You see, very interestingly that, you know, sometimes we're assuming things. We're, we see the things over the, what is on, on the surface, right? We see the things. And why do we assume that? Or why do we know this, if you will? Because, see, God is 
It's really interesting that God is present, even though if you don't, don't see God in there, you see? There is no mentioning of him. There is nothing. There is, but we know that it was God putting you know, the, the, the things in place, here, 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 and there. His presence was there, and he take care of his people. So today I would like to remind you of two things when we talk about God. His sovereignty, God's sovereignty. He's a ruler of all universe. He knows from the biggest universes, I mean, from the biggest galaxies, the biggest uh, places, that he knows everything. He cares about everything. The whole universe is in his domain. He knows what's happening in your life, in your life, in your life. And he cares. He knows what's happening. So something is really uh, that we need to understand. Uh, Apostle Paul in, in um, Colossians uh, writes something interesting. So uh, let's go to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. And uh, he writes, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were cre created by him and for him. And does he just create things and let it go? No, he doesn't. He creates things and he cares for this. He cares what you do. He cares for your good. He cares of you know good of this planet. He cares the good of this you, whole universe. He cares. He's supreme ruler over everything, and he cares. And it is really comforting, comforting to know that one day he will bring everything to the perfect conclusion. So there's nothing. Well, just happened. Nothing by chance. He will bring everything to the perfect conclusion. And the other thing about God is providence. He knows your life and my life. He knows what might happen. He knows what it would be good for you and for me. And that's why today in the lesson when we were studying, we mentioned this. The Holy Spirit constantly not pushing himself on us, but constantly is over there reminding us, don't do this, don't go there. And if we allow this spirit to work in us freely, then we are on a good track. We are on a good track. So God's providence. <laughs> I, I have to come closer to, 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 the, to our thinking today. Let's be real. You know, what is the one thing that wherever you talk, wherever we, whenever we talk about the health, whenever we talk about some, you know, the healthy living, or, what is the first thing that the, a lot of doctors, a lot of scientists, a lot of people who know more about the way of our uh, body and our, our way of living, what they saying? I, uh, beside the eating uh, healthy uh, exercise and all this, what is the main thing that everybody think? Stress, right? <sighs> stress. Don't stress. Well, it's easy to say don't stress, but you know the life is stressed in itself. You know, the, you go wherever you go and you go, sit in your car and then you know somebody cuts you off and this and that. You know, there's uh, traffic. I need to be there. Don't stress. Well. It's not easy, right? Don't stress. Why am I saying that? Don't stress because God knows what is the best for you. So wait, you know how many times in the Bible says, wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Well, our father, <laughs> Abraham, what did he do? Well, he waited for some time and then he said, well, it's enough. I think I can help him, you know. A lot of times we do the same thing, but 
we need to understand one thing, that he has a plan for you and for me, for each and every one of us. He has a plan. And if we are following that plan, then we shouldn't have a stress. We shouldn't have a stress. <sighs> Let's go back to the Bible and we'll read in 1 John 4, 18. So 1 John, 1 John 4, 18. So 1 John 4, 18, and we are told here that, listen to this, there is no fear in love, but for perfect love casteth our fear, because fear had torment, he had feared, uh, he that feared is not made perfect in love. Why is that? I mean, this is Bible, and he read it, I mean, we read it, you know, it's kind of old language. Well, why in love, in perfect love, there is no fear? Why is that? What do you think? And if you have perfect love, if you have a fear, then you don't have a perfect love. And if you have a perfect love, you don't have a fear. Why is that? If you, well, in the Bible, I mean, in, in our lesson today also, we talk about love. And John also is talking about this love later on. If we have this love, I mean, sorry, the, 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 our Creator had a love for us, and if we have love back to Him, there is no fear. He's never going to cut the cord of His love first. He's never going to do this first. The problem is that, see, if I don't have this love, if I don't love Him perfectly, which means I trust Him, I trust Him in everything that I do in, the, in my life, so there's no fear. Even, what are we told? Even if Job, Job told us, even if he kills me, right? If I die, if I'm in good relation with him, what should I be fear of? What should I be? Is there any need for fear or stress? No. So you see what I'm getting to? If I perfectly love him and trust him, whatever he does for me, then there is no need for stress. There is no need for fear. Because he cares for me, and he will do whatever is needed. Even if I die, so be it. Because what? This life is just a what? Introduction, preparation for the life that is, a, you know, the, the real life that is standing uh, uh, for each and every one of us. So there is no need for fear. But I know what you're going to say. It's easy to say that, but you know, in my life I have this and that and that. I hear you. I understand that. And now I'm going to go back to the Esther. Imagine that. She was, let's start from the beginning. She was what? She didn't have the father or she didn't have the mother. Who cared for her? Mordecai, her cousin, right? She lost the mother and father, so she was orphaned. Of course, as such, I don't know how much she had, you know, the life and then all this. But finally, she got to the position of what? Come on. She was a queen of the leading power at this time. Queen. Well, now she's in a good position, right? She is somebody now. She, something happening. Finally, something good. And then Mordecai comes to her in chapter 4 and tells her the text that Brother Jim just read. What did he tell her? You know what? It's been a development, and if you don't do anything, somebody else will, basically, right? So let's read that. Chapter 4, verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, what time? Everybody is going to get killed. And you think that the king is not going to know that you were Jew too? Yeah, think again. Everybody everybody will be destroyed, and to you together with it. Then shall uh, their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Uh-huh. So now we start to understand something else. If you fail, if you don't do what you're supposed to, basically what he said you're supposed to do, you are on this position for what reason? Look at what it says after. Arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? 
So now, let me ask you a question. Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why I'm here? Why I'm here in this country? I mean, me and my cousin and my wife, we came over here in Canada 26 years ago, 27 years ago. Why I'm here? Just to make a living for myself, maybe? Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are we here in the church today? Do you ever ask yourself, what is the reason that we go through the life and just do whatever we do? What is the reason that I'm here on this earth? <clears throat> Let me go back to the Esther. In Romans chapter 8, 28. So let's go back to Romans. Sorry, I'm going a little back and forth. But let's go back to Romans chapter 8. What happened to, to Esther? It was really good. I mean, at least she was, um, she was uh, thinking this way, right? So Romans <clears throat> chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 28. So it says here, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. So I guess she, well, things were good for Esther, and she loved God, and she was a queen of uh, Persia, right? Is that, is that how the things work? Well, sometime, right? But is that means if I love God, that I will be rich, that will drive out, you know, really crazy car, that I will have the everything that it needs, that, you know, everybody's going to love me, that, the, you know, everything works good for me. Is that what it means? Is that what the apostle uh, is, is telling us here? Every, well, let's read the second part of these words. That the, the love of God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, something is more than that, right? We, if we work for his purpose. Ah, so what is his purpose? So I can do things, you know, what I think it's, it's right. I can do things that, you know, um, you know make money and then and you make the life good for me, for my kids, for my family, for my own purpose, right? So, to you, I can you know, say, oh, this is what I am. Or I can work for his purpose. So now go back to Esther. When Mordecai, or her cousin, tell her, you know what, now it's basically the ball is in your court. What are you going to do now? Are you going to do something about it, or are you just going to let it go? It's up to you. And what was the answer? Well, first of all, was she scared? Oh, I think so. Why she was scared? Because according to the, to the king, for 30 days, before, prior to that, there was nobody entering to the king. And if he doesn't ask you to come in, you don't enter. Under what uh, condition? You are dead if you enter in there without to be um, called. So she was scared, right? She was scared. But after some thinking, what did she say to, to, to Mordecai? I will do it. But. Now, again, something that we should consider. But. I will do it, but you will go back and talk to the people, and you going to do what? Fast and pray. And I will do the same thing. And everything's going to be fine. What did she say that after that? If I perish, I perish. You see? There is a the fear, but if you have a perfect love, what happens? If I perish, I perish. At least I know I did what? I follow what? His plan. You see that? See how that's simple uh, explanation. I follow his plan. If I perish, I perish. There's nothing you know, I can do about this. But at least I know I was doing according to his will. So, according to the purpose that he has for us. 
If you go back to uh, Genesis chapter 50, you talk, uh, we, we, we can read about the Joseph. I'm not going to read now. About Joseph. What did he do? What did he say on the way to the Egypt? What shall I do? I will follow the rules or the basic law of the, my, my God. Whatever happens, happens. Right? I, I can't change that. But I will do what? Whatever I was taught by my father, by my you know, mother before that, I will follow that and I will follow the rules of my creator. And whatever happens, similar to this, whatever happens, happens, right? We are all a part of this great plan. Apostle Peter is explaining this in the first Peter chapter two. So first Peter chapter two, and he's telling us a little bit more about the purpose. So first Peter chapter two, verse nine. And he's telling us here, but ye are, listen to what he's saying here to the, um, to the people. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Up to now, we are liking it, right? You're a chosen people, a peculiar, a holy nation. And now listen to the second part. What is the purpose of being that people? That ye should show for the praises of him who had called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So what is the purpose of me and you being a chosen generation or somebody chosen or called by God? What is my purpose? To follow his plan and to do what? To show for the praises of him who sent me. So that he can say, same as uh, for the Abraham, same as for uh, Joseph, same as for the Daniel, same as for all, many, many of these people. What did he say? This is my people. God said for, for Dan, to Daniel, this is my friend, Abraham. I talk to him face to face. Do you understand that? So these are my people, so he can be proud of us. We do his will. Fast and pray. That's what she did. Fast and pray, and whatever happened, happened. And we know, according to the story, what happens, right? Every time that we, I'm, I'm thinking about this topic of... Uh, doing his will. Every time that, you know, I'm starting to think about, think, uh, thinking about Joseph, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Moses. Think about Moses. Moses, in our own logic, you know, when, when you think how God could accomplish this, wouldn't it be easier to let Moses be a Pharaoh and then let the people go out of from Egypt, right? In our own log logic, that would be much easier. Well, just, you know, Moses is kind of following the plan. He's going to let the people go. And it's simple. But see, the catch is in something else. It's not only, see, when he's fulfilling the plan for this earth, for whole universe, for everybody, it's not, I mean, he can do the, his plan with somebody else. He doesn't need me and you. He doesn't need it. But in this, he's including me and you in this plan to do what? To show me and you, what he can do, what blessing we can be for the people around us, what blessing he can give it to us. You understand? So I can be a part of this plan. So it is not that I'm helping him. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm, he's doing this for me. God doing this so he can help me. I can be a part of this plan, this great plan, so that we can show, as the Apostle says here, that we can show to people around us the praises of him who had called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. This marvelous light that he showed us. We talked to, to, again this morning in our lessons about the light that shone in the bright second, uh, second verse in the Bible. says, God called what? A light to this world. And this light... If we allow him to be in our heart, we can, sh through us, this light can be shown to other people around us. The same light. This is the purpose that he has for me and you.
And no, you know what happened to the Moses? After he left uh, Egypt, what happened to him? 40 years he was doing what thing? Oh, he was in the wilderness doing what? Shepherd. Wow, how can you call this a learning? <laughs> he called him into his own school to teach him what? To empty himself of himself. Today, again, back to the lesson. How can I accomplish something? Only if I allow him to accomplish this through me, if I empty myself. Yeah, I, it's impossible to do this. It's impossible to do this if I don't empty myself or myself. So he did need Moses. He could do this with, with somebody else, but the Moses was blessed with this. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid because he's in, in the control. Our fear is doing what to us? It's just preventing us from doing the great things. Our fear is just preventing us, nothing else. One, another example, Elijah. What happened to Elijah when he gets scared of Jezebel? What happened to him? <sighs> Flew away over there in the wilderness and hide himself in a cave. He said, oh, Lord, help me. She, she wants to kill me. But Elijah, come on, what, 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 is, what, what is wrong with you? You just work such a marvelous work day before that. Testify so greatly, and now you're afraid of this woman? You see what the fear does to us? And what was the question that the Lord asked him in front of this cave? After this great uh, uh, wind and fire and everything, it was a small voice asking him, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. See, sometimes we need to hear that voice. What are you doing here? You're in the wrong place. You're on the wrong time. You're doing the wrong thing. What are you doing? You're not following my plan. Problem is that we still hear this great wind. We still, you know, we are, we do, we do, there is not quiet thing around us so we can hear the voice of God. There is we always surrounded with such a big noise around us with everything else. We don't hear that voice. What are you doing here? I have a plan for you. Paul fall off the horse because of a light shine upon him. And the same voice was asking, what are you doing, Paul? What are you doing? You're on wrong path. You were on going wrong way. Sometime we need that reminder today. Question that we need to ask ourselves, is this the place that I need to be today? Is this the job that I need to do today? Is this the right thing to be, or right place to be? Is the Lord sent me to do this? This is the question that each and every one of us need to ask ourselves. The question that we need to ask is, Lord, show me thy will for me this day. In Romans chapter 12, Apostle Paul is telling us, so Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What is my service today? Presenting my body to who? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is my duty every day, my and your duty. Again, I will remind you, God doesn't need me to accomplish his plan. He doesn't need you or you. He can accomplish this with somebody else. But the problem is that I will be, as Esther, left alone. I, I'm not going to be a, plan, a, a part of this plan. And what's going to happen with me? This is the question. What will happen to me if I don't follow this plan? 
My dear brothers and sisters, today I would like to ask you the question that we just read. Brother Jim read it in the beginning from Esther. Let me read it again. If this happened to us, the question is, and who know whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who know it if you are not here for such a time? Who knows what tomorrow brings for me today? Or tomorrow, or the day after? We don't know. But think about this. If I don't follow him today, what's going to happen tomorrow? I will close with the Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1. To three. But now thus said the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord, thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. May the Lord help us. Amen.